Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome to New Books in Philosophy, a podcast channel with the New Books Network. I'm Carrie Figdor, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Iowa, and I'm co-host of the channel along with Robert Talese, Sarah Tyson, and Malcolm Keating. Together, we bring you conversations with philosophers about their new books in a wide range of areas of contemporary philosophical inquiry. Today's interview is with Eric Schwitzgabel, professor of philosophy at the University of California at Riverside. His new book, The Weirdness of the World, is just out from Princeton University Press. What's life for if there's no time to play and explore? So ends Eric Schwitzgabel's new book, where he invites the reader to a walk on the wilder side of philosophical speculation about the cosmos and consciousness. Is consciousness entirely a material phenomenon? How much credence should we have in the existence of a world outside our minds? Are there multiple parallel universes? Schwitzgabel Gable constructs chains of conditional probabilities to explore the zone just beyond the edge of what we can understand, however imperfectly, given current scientific theory. He also distinguishes hypothetical scenarios that are not worth taking seriously, like being a brain in a vat, from those that are just plausible enough to to deserve playful yet motivated consideration. Let's turn to the interview. Um, hello, Eric Schwitzgabel. Welcome to New Books and Philosophy. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, it should be a fun ride talking about your latest book, uh, The Weirdness of the World. And I should say for for longtime listeners of New Books and Philosophy, uh, Professor Schwitzgabel was my very few, very first interviewee for this podcast, and he was extremely... Uh, patient <laughs> with the process um, of learning how to do it correctly, including uh, being willing to go through the interview twice because I messed up the recording. Um, but also, I mean, there's another sense in which, you know, the the 12 years that have separated these two books, there's also a commonality in that the first book that, that I did was Perplexities of Consciousness, 2011. Now we're talking about the weirdness of the world in which a lot of the perplexities about consciousness kind of persist. Um, so I still haven't figured it out. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us a bit, you know, about yourself and then, you know, how this book came about. Right. So, um, yeah, I'm a professor of philosophy at UC Riverside. I've been thinking about consciousness pretty seriously for almost 25 years now i got into it because kind of sideways in a way as most philosophers would think of it through developmental psychology because i was really interested in some of this research especially by john flavel and alison gopnik about how poorly young children seem to know their own minds and that seemed to conflict with what philosophers were saying about the privilege of self-knowledge, which they didn't say, oh, if you're an adult, you're privileged. (laughs) That got me into thinking about how poorly we know our own conscious experience. That was the topic of the book you interviewed me about before. But that then got me thinking about general theories of consciousness and our poor epistemic relationship or poor understanding of just the foundations of consciousness and what kinds of entities are conscious and whether AI systems or non-human animals would be conscious and how we could tell. So my perplexities (laughs) that I started with early on in my research about our knowledge of our own experience became perplexities about the fundamental bases of consciousness, which then tied into fundamental issues of cosmology, as we'll probably talk about. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's what uh, generated this book. Okay, good. Well, I think we should start, you know, the weirdness of the world. Um, uh, What's weird? What is, what is, this is somewhat of a technical term here. So yeah, I'm using it. I have a technical definition of weird. Something is weird if it's strikingly contrary to the normal, ordinary, and readily understood. So 
<laughs> right. So this is kind of based on my experiences in middle school of being called weird. <laughs> because the people who called me weird didn't seem to think I was uh, normal or readily understood. Sure. Um, and I think this, the world, you know, in some sense, the world has to be normal. But the theories that are correct about it, whatever they are, I think whatever the truth is about the world is not going to fit very well with our normal understandings of things and is to some extent going to defy any of our attempts to understand it with the tools that are currently available to us or are likely to be available to us in the near future. Okay. So this, this was something actually that I, so there's a, there's a, there's an implicit idea that, you know, somehow uh, I, I, I'm not sure of the, let me put it this way. I'm not sure of the relationship that you are, you know, taking for granted maybe uh, is, uh, you know, between science and scientific theories versus common sense. I mean, there's a lot mm -hmm. of, you know, weirdness, you know, you know, even that in the world that, you know, scientific theories you know, do end up explaining, and they're you know, it's it's questionable whether they fit. You know, common sense. We get used to them, so maybe the sense of weirdness kind of dissipates. Yes, but I'm not so. Sh I I wasn't quite sure how you were navigating this relationship between you know common sense. To, you know, does a scientific theory have to satisfy common sense? Uh, and, you know, why would that be, uh, you know, sort of a criterion of any sort? Um, and then I guess, secondly, uh, why would that limitation of, you know, common sense, uh, in, you know, imply anything about the, you know, the difficulty of you know science to explain say consciousness or um or the cosmos those just seem to be very different sorts of problems yeah so i do agree that science doesn't have to conform to common sense so one and it can be well confirmed even when it defies common sense and one example of this is the twin paradox in relativity theory right the idea that if you and your twin start on earth your twin accelerates away from earth near the speed of light then turns around and comes back less time will have elapsed for your twin than for you <laughs> and that is really contrary to common sense but that those kinds of time dilation effects in relativity theory are so well confirmed that I think we can just bracket the res resistance of common sense for those kinds of cases. Mm -hmm. But when, when we get to the edge of our scientific understanding, things where um, science does not deliver really clear answers, the kind of biggest, most troubling cosmological questions, there I think... We don't have that kind of empirical security that allows us to just say, okay, well, we know this is true, so don't worry about common sense. The scientific tools become themselves kind of frail and rubbery. Mm -hmm. So we don't have actually, I think, any good method for saying, here is the definite answer. <laughs> so we have to bring in the poor method, the several poor methods that we have, one mm -hmm. of which is just, well, we've got to start somewhere. Right. Common sense is kind of our starting place. If a scientific theory is going to defy common sense, it has to earn it. So if we think about something like, are there multiple parallel universes? Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing you can't just straightforwardly test. There are some reason scientists some scientists think this is plausible. There are some maybe theoretical disadvantages to it. It probably defies, to some extent, common sense. So we end up considering issues like that with this kind of 
poor set of tools for figuring out the answer. And then common sense belongs among those tools. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. What makes the tools poor? Well, I think we really have three broad ways of approaching a, a big question like, are there multiple universes or does consciousness is consciousness an entirely material phenomenon take those two examples Mm. right one is we can do empirical research and empirical research is not irrelevant right uh the fact that we've tried seances and have not discovered you know communications through immaterial beings through seances is a kind of empirical evidence against a certain way in which materialism could have been false and there's some elegance for example to the empirical story about the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics you don't end up having to worry about the dynamics of collapse we can get into quantum mechanics if you want Um, so there's some attractiveness some scientific attractiveness some empirical attractiveness to say materialism and to uh, many worlds but it's not like we have a many worlds ometer uh-huh. <laughs> that we could just say ah well here's the straightforward answer and there are some disadvantages to it theoretically so we can think in terms of empirical evidence that's kind of weak for settling whether there's many worlds or not. We can think about things like theoretical elegance, fruitfulness, usefulness as a paradigm for foundations of further scientific thinking. Mm -hmm. Again, that's kind of indecisive. And we can think about, well, does this defy our ordinary understanding? Is this in violation with our kind of default starting point? So those are kind of the tools that we have, I think, and none of them are really decisive with regard to questions like this. It, is is this a is this a matter of our you know the status of our thinking at this time, or is this a deeper like we will never be able to like you know some sort of. Um, uh, you know, some people argue we will never be able to explain consciousness. You know, that's just, that's their that's their view. Um, is that is that your view? We will never be able to, or is it or is it not that? Is it more just we just can't do it now? My view is we can't do it now or for the foreseeable future. Okay. Um, but it's striking to me what science can reveal with enough time. <laughs> Right. You you might not have thought they a few centuries ago that we could look up in the sky, look at patterns of light and then figure out all of the amazing stuff we figured about out about what happens during the first second of the Big Bang. Right. How could you get that from what basically could be a video show in the sky? <laughs> but we but, you know, it we do have pretty good reasons to accept standard Big Bang theory. So. Yeah, it's amazing what science can do. It can, I think it can take us beyond the reach of what we can foresee. But, but I think as far as we can foresee, we're not going to settle the issue of consciousness or the issue of multiple worlds or, or some of those other issues. So, right. So it's not that there are some particular issues that I think we will never solve. It's okay. more that science and philosophical understanding will progress, but there will always be, I think, something beyond the edge of what we can understand. And what lies beyond the edge can change, right? The circle of light can grow, so to speak, and the and the ring of darkness around it will grow with it. So what used to be in the darkness can become illuminated, but I think there will always be some darkness, some foundational issues just beyond the edge of what we can uh, understand. Okay. So, um, so one of the, you know, to get to, uh, well, you've mentioned the cosmos and some of the problems there and of course, consciousness. Um, But another one of the threads that, that runs through the book 
uh, is actually the, you know, as I see it, uh, you know, a very old philosophical problem of, you know, why should we believe that there's an external world, right? Um, you know, which, right. you know, became famous with, with Descartes, you know, it, it preexisted him, but, you know, the whole idea that we're living in a, you know, we're, we're dreaming, right? The dream argument and so forth. Um, can you, you know, say a bit about your, 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 uh, your flights of fancy, I should say, uh, <laughs> regard, regarding, yeah. you know, regarding the idea of skepticism about the external world? I mean, that's, uh, th that seems to be a somewhat different question than what we've just been talking about. Um, so, yes. so tell us a bit about that question, and then maybe we can see how they relate to the others. Right. So I'm what I call a 1% skeptic in the sense yeah. that I uh, attach about a 99% to 99.9% .9 credence that the world is basically how we take it to be, you know, setting aside these questions of, bi of big theory that we we're just talking about, right? That you and I are having a conversation that mm -hmm. the world has existed for millions of years and that sort of thing. Uh, and then I allow myself uh, 0.1 to 1% credence in that some radically skeptical scenario is true so that a, a wide swath of my ordinary common beliefs about the world are wrong. So that's the 1% skepticism position. Mm -hmm. And I have a few arguments for it. Uh, and then I also have uh, an attempt for scientific proof that the external world exists um yeah i wanted to ask about that but um but maybe we'll start with the reasons the arguments that uh we should have at least uh, one percent or about one okay. percent yeah. credence in uh some radically skeptical scenario i think the easiest and most traditional easiest is a little maybe not the right word but the most traditional argument that i have for this is a version of the dream argument right so mm -hmm. The thought here is that according to some theories of dreams, some scientifically respectable theories of dreams, not my favorite actually, but um, but I'm not highly confident that my favorite theory of dreams is correct. <laughs> according to definitely some mainstream scientific theories of dreams, while you're dreaming, you have experiences that are a lot like the experiences you have when you're awake. So you and I, could in dreams have experiences very much like we're having of having a, a chat on a podcast and a listener could while they're dreaming have experiences very much like they listening to a podcast while jogging or whatever they're doing mm -hmm. whatever credence we attach to that scientific theory you know maybe i don't know 20 percent once we accept that i think it becomes hard to feel justifiably super 100% confidence that the experience you're having right now isn't one of those dream experiences. I mean, maybe there are tests. People think there are tests. People often have favorite tests for whether they're dreaming. Like my mom has this test. She says, well, look, if I flick the lights off and on, the ambient lighting in the room doesn't change. That's how I know whether I'm dreaming. Right? Some people say, oh, if I pinch myself and I, and I, I don't feel pain, I could tell that uh, I'm dreaming. And if I do feel pain, I'm awake. Mm -hmm. But our confidence in these kinds of tests, I don't think should be 100%. It doesn't seem preposterous that you could dream of a, a painful pinch or the right. light changing in a room, whatever. Well, uh, yeah, let me let me just, I mean, I find, you know, 1% or even 0.1 to ex extraordinarily high as, as a, you know, credence. Yes. Um, to me, it, it, you, it should really be something like um, vanishingly small. Yeah. Um, you know, so once you get into the, you know, the realm of, you know, huge or infinite possibilities, um, uh, it's not clear that, um, that we should give this much, that much credence. So I, in a way, I kind of, what justifies like one percent? It is a little hard to defend a really specific credence. So I 
I think I can only invite you and invite the reader to a certain kind of reflection. And if it doesn't move, then I don't know how much more I can do. Uh -huh. But I think but I, the way that I like to think about it is multiplying conditional credences against each other, right? So maybe you have a 20% credence in this theory of dreams and then think now, okay, so what proportion of my experiences of doing ordinary mundane things like this are dream experiences? Well, people dream a lot of the night, even if they don't remember it. The dream science suggests that people spend much of the night most REM sleep and maybe a lot of non-REM sleep dreaming, right? So maybe 10% mm -hmm. of your experiences kind of like this are in dreams. So now we multiply that 10% by the 20% and now we've got 2%. So if you're, if 2% of your experiences of interviewing somebody for a podcast are actually dream experiences, how confident should you be that this isn't one of them? Should you really be 99.9999999% confident that this isn't one of those experiences? I, I'm not sure what would justify that level of confidence given the conditional credences. Hmm. Right. So that's about all I can do. <laughs> that's about all I could do. So I think I... When I think about it that way, I say, oh, yeah, okay, well, maybe 0.1% creed that I'm dreaming right now actually is is reasonable. It's a little hard to hold on to that thought for a long period of time. I just then assume I'm, you know, after a few right. minutes, I just assume I'm awake, right? But I think when I pause and reflect on that dream idea, mm -hmm. it seems to be justified to not be for absolute certainty that I'm awake. Right, okay. Um, well, there's a, there's a funny, I found funny passage in the book where you mentioned just sort of blurting out when you're driving your son to, to school or something, I think you exist, but I'm not sure or something along those <laughs> lines. Right. Um, how did how do your like family and friends i mean do you is that something you do regularly <laughs> no <laughs> no i don't <laughs> i did do it with my son one time driving him to school as i was thinking about this stuff i think i said something like i'm almost certain you exist <laughs> yeah <laughs> and he he i think this was in middle school or early high school and he he knew enough about my thinking to kind of take it in stride and know what i was talking about um, I do find it weird <laughs> in kind of multiple senses of weird uh -huh. and off-putting to th think that way about people that I'm currently interacting with, especially uh -huh. people I love, right? When I'm alone in my office, it's kind of fun and easy to imagine, hey, what if there's no external world, you know, beyond this? What if I'm dreaming? Um, but when I'm with somebody to think that maybe they don't exist feels kind of like a bad move, <laughs> creepy or weird or something. Mm -hmm. um, so I let myself, I'm inclined to not do it partly for that reason. Uh -huh. And I do think that um, reasons for skepticism about yesterday and tomorrow are a little stronger than the reasons for skepticism about the existence of the person that you currently appear to be interacting with. So mm -hmm. I find it a little easier, but again, this is just weighing of, of plausibilities that I think people could totally disagree about, but I find it a little easier to doubt yesterday and tomorrow than I do to doubt the existence of the person I appear to be interacting with. Mm -hmm. So if I'm in a skeptical mood, Right, it's more like you and me together. Maybe we're together in a simulation or a briefly existing world. Right. Um, well, now that you mentioned simulations, I mean a modern, you know, as as probably many listeners are aware, um, the kind of modern formulation of Descartes' dream argument has taken the you know the shape of. Um, uh, Nick Bostrom's arguments about, you know, we're living in a simulation or, 
you know, the movie The Matrix, of course, is, you know, famously uh, tries to depict this. Um, uh, what's your take on these sorts of ways of articulating the the basic skeptical scenario? Do you think, do they help? Are they better? Are they worse? Is, you know, just pure philosophical speculation improved by these new met new ways of thinking about it? Hey. Hi. Somehow, somehow we got disconnected. I don't know what happened. Oh, um, okay. Well, did you hear my question? Um, I was going on about how I find it easier to doubt yesterday and tomorrow than to doubt the existence of the person I'm interacting with. <laughs> I think that came out okay. And then I asked a question about simulation. Did you hear that? I did not hear that. Uh huh. Since, uh, since we have the break, why don't I take the occasion to uh, go to the restroom? So perfect. Uh, yeah. yeah okay. No I'll problem. I'll be right back. And then you can ask that question. Okay. Okay. Um, so let me let me ask about uh, simulation theories because these are like Nick Bostrom's work. Uh, you know, on uh, the possible idea that we are, you know, Sims in a computer simulation or um, the movie, The Matrix, right? You know, famously tries to, you know, actually show this type of a scenario. Um, do, you, do you think those sorts of ways of, of um, uh, articulating maybe the idea of radical skepticism or even 1% skepticism, uh, do they add anything to just plain philosophical re reflection like, you know, you've been doing with dreams? Uh, are they an improvement on the basic question? Do they add anything? Do they subtract anything? I do think they add something. So what I think they add is another plausible source of doubt. Again, you know, we're in the ballpark of 0.1% here in my credence estimation mm -hmm. uh but so before people started thinking about simulation seriously skeptics would ask things like well what if i'm a brain in a vat that right. out orbiting around alpha centauri and they're a genius neuroscientist stimulating things so it seems exactly as if i'm having ordinary experiences well there's no reason to take that seriously as a possibility uh, other than the most remote possibility. So it's not, I think, a grounded skepticism. It's kind of an ungrounded what if. There's no positive reason to think that it has any non-trivial chance of being true. Whereas I think what we get with simulation skepticism is an argument similar to what I gave with the dream argument for a small but non-trivial chance that, hey, this <laughs> could actually be true. Mm -hmm. So, so I think that is a really relevant difference between old school brain in the vat skepticism mm. and simulation theory. So let me let me let me press on that a little because that's an interesting distinction. Um, uh, it it seems like the the sense of you know possibility if you want to put it this way is you you might be drawing a distinction here between what is say logically possible or metaphysically possible and somehow what is you know nomologically or physically uh possible um is is that a correct it's not exactly that what distinction. you just said yeah not exactly that distinction because i think it's nomolo nomologically or epistemically possible that I'm a brain in a vat, <laughs> but I would give that <laughs> a vanishingly small credence. Why? Whereas why would I give that one a vanishingly small credence? Well, st starting with common sense and modern science, right? As my starting point, I don't see any reason to think that it's at all likely that I say, if we take a version of it in which aliens visited me last night, extracted my brain while I was sleeping, and I've now got it in a vat, right? There's just 
no positive reason to give that any but the smallest chance of being true. We don't have any reliable signs that aliens have visited, even if they did, you know, it doesn't seem like they'd be likely to do this sort of thing. Even if they <laughs> did this sort of thing, doesn't it seem like there would be some glitches or problems? Is this really something that would be feasible at all? Right. That's just you're multiplying the credences against each other, the conditional credences against each other. I think you swiftly end up with a very small credence. Mm -hmm. Whereas for the simulation argument, the credences stay a bit larger, right? So, um, to walk mm -hmm. through it just a little bit, right? Yeah. First thing you need to believe is that consciousness would be implementable on computers. Now, there is reasonable disagreement about that. I would say probably the majority view among consciousness scientists and philosophers of mind is that under the right conditions, you could have computers or AI systems that were conscious, but that's certainly not a full consensus view. So, mm -hmm. you know, Maybe give yourself a 50% credence or a 5% credence or a 95% credence in that or whatever, but, you know, somewhere in the realm of not extreme, uh, that there could be consciousness uh, in computers. And then conditional on that, think about, okay, well, if computers can be conscious, then could there be conscious systems that live purely in virtual environments rather than, say, just robots with computer brains, but actually simulated beings living in virtual worlds, kind of like the entities in SimCity, mm -hmm. uh, right? And I guess it, to me, seems pretty plausible that if you allow, once you allow that computer systems or AI systems could be conscious, you could also allow that they live in some sort of virtual world with virtual inputs. And then conditional upon that, you can think about, okay, so if we allow that that's possible how many such beings would there be in the universe well could be very few maybe it's expensive to make these maybe there'd be no reason to make these on the other hand it could be there could be a lot of them right it could be that for reasons of scientific exploration or entertainment people make lots of virtual entities who think they're living in the base level of reality, but who are actually AIs living in a simulated environment. I'm not sure which way the cosmos would be conditional upon the earlier assumptions. And then once we get there, we can think, okay, well, if there are a lot of such beings in the cosmos, do I have any particular reason to think I'm not one of them? It doesn't seem like I do have a strong reason to think I'm not one of them. Right, so we're multiplying a bunch, a bunch of uncertainties against each other, but I don't see how this gets down to 0 0.0000001, right? To me, it seems like you're in the ballpark of a one in a thousand credence or something like that, that, that uh, in being a, a sim. Once you kind of think in a vivid way about the possibilities envisioned. So I think that's kind of qualitatively as well as quantitatively different epistemic situation mm -hmm. than I am with respect to being a brain in a vat. Mm, okay. And how is it with respect to our knowledge of the external world? I mean, which is kind of where this always ends up. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting things here is that most people who defend the idea that we might be living in a simulation. Hello? 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 Okay, go ahead. Right. So one thing that's kind of striking to me is that most of the advocates of the idea that we might be living in a simulation, like Nick Bostrom, David Chalmers, Eric Steinhardt, mm. downplay the potential skeptical implications. They suggest, oh, well, we might be living in a simulation, but if so... It's probably a large, stable one, and as long as you exist and I exist and it's a large, stable world, then, you know, you're going to have the – that chair is going to be still in the room when you come back. You're going to have all the experiences that you think, and so the world isn't really radically different than you think it is, right? At some fundamental metaphysical level, yes, but in terms of all the people you know exist, yes, 
right? In terms of you're climbing a mountain, well, you're having the experience of it. That's good enough uh -huh. uh, for it to count as a real mountain. Um, so what I'm inclined to think, though, is that conditional upon, again, we're multiplying mm -hmm. credences against each other in various ways, but condi conditional upon thinking that we're in a sim, we ought to allow, allow a substantial subportion of our conditional credence in that to be that we're living in a small or unstable sim. So, for example, if we think about most of the simulations that we run as a model, Mm -hmm. right? Most of those simulations we run, scientific simulations or simulations in games like SimCity, tend to be relatively short term. Also, to try to run a full simulation of a giant world from beginning to end would probably be very resource intensive. You know, if we're in a sim, we don't really know much about who is simulating us, right? But you might think, well, probably there will be some resource constraints, so maybe they wouldn't want to run giant expensive sims now maybe they maybe they would but i just don't think that there's grounds really for confidence that if we're in a sim it's going to be a large stable one so i think we mm. kind of have to allow that if we're sims it might have started up 10 minutes ago it might end it might just be you and me having a philosophical conversation as part of this you know, entertainment or study that our simulators are running of philosophical conversations it could just be you know, one city that's being run for the sake of entertainment and the the simulator is going to let loose Godzilla any minute for to, to watch our reactions. Mm -hmm. I think we have to allow that, those possibilities as significant possibilities conditional upon the possibility that we're living in a sim. So that's how I think we get from simulation to 1% or 0.1% skepticism. Hmm. I would, you know, I, I wanted to ask about your, your at least one of your empirical, your experiments about, um, uh, about the ex existence of an external world. But before I get to that question, um, I mean, it would seem that, you know, given the glitches and, you know, fuzzy and cutoffs and stuff with, um, <laughs> with virtual reality now um it, not to mention our conversation i don't yeah. know if your listeners know we've, <laughs> we've, we've already been cut off i know twice. so it seems to me that that's an argument against us being a sim a fairly strong one you know you would have to imagine things being so so much more reliable than they are um, that the idea of, you know, that, the, the, you know, glitches or little fuzzy bits or, you know, there are movies that sometimes play with this idea when something visual kind of gets fuzzy for a little bit, right. um, you know, and that's all symbolic of, you know, the simulation, you know, kind of running out of juice for a second or something like right. that. Yeah, since I think the fact that, that we have since that doesn't happen, uh, we should be even more skeptical that we're in a sim. We should we should lower our credences to almost nothing. Well, I don't agree about the almost nothing, but I do agree that that is part of the empirical evidence that you could use to decrease your credence that this is a sim. Right? Uh -huh. You might think, oh, if this is a sim, then. We should be seeing glitches, or at least a certain percentage of sims would tend to have glitches. But I guess it's certainly possible that a large sim could run without glitches. We don't know. If we're in a sim, we don't know that much about the resources of our uh, engineers or creators. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I think that's more of a trouble for large-scale sims than for small-scale sims, right? So if we if we focus really on the skeptical versions of this, in which you and I are the only existing members of this simulation and we've only been going for an hour, well, we've already encountered two glitches. Right. <laughs> and you certainly, and you don't have, you only have kind of fake evidence of, based on your fake memories, that there aren't glitches from yesterday and the day before and last year. So I think the glitch argument works a little better 
against the stable, long-term stable simulation art, uh, version than against the short version. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let me, let me, uh, I mean, there's a couple, there's a few chapters in the book where you kind of go off into very, uh, you know, different sorts of directions from, from what we've been talking about. Um, you know, what, one is the idea that, you know, somehow, uh, whatever you do, like causes everything. <laughs> um, yeah. And, uh, and, and other uh, is much more focused on uh, consciousness in, uh, in non-humans, you know, you use the, uh, the example of a garden snail, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, let's, let's talk about the, um, I mean, all of these are very fun cases and they're, you, you write about them with, with a lot of a lot of glee, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> um, Good. I'm glad you picked that up. <laughs> I did. I did. Um, uh, yeah. Why? Why think that um, what I do causes everything? Yeah. Um... <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty wild. <laughs> That's pretty wild. It's pretty wild. So I should say that this chapter was co-written with uh, Jacob Berendes, who's a physicist and philosopher of physics. Uh -huh. um, so, so the basic idea is that on current standard vanilla ordinary physical theory, the universe has no temporal edge in the future. That is, it will continue infinitely. Now, there will be heat death on standard theory. Mm -hmm. Um but after heat death, there's no theory that says, oh, yeah, and then time will come to a stop. Oh, I mean, we, we don't even really, we'd have to create some or in, <laughs> dis discover some some dynamics for what happens to, to say, the remaining particles post-heat death, you know, when time stops. Uh, there's no kind of really good theory of that. So the standard view is that oh, things will just continue post-heat death. Post-heat death, um, the standard view also but you know there are alternative views to this. But the standard view is that there will be random configurations of particles that converge by chance, right? So once in a while, seven of these diffuse, sparse, low energy particles will converge by chance, or 17 will, or 17 million will, or 17 trillion will. There's no kind of limitation to in principle to the size and structure of what could happen by chance in the post heat death universe so this then leads to the boltzmann brain hypothesis this goes all the way back to ludwig boltzmann uh, the 19th century physicist who hypothesized in fact that the origin of the galaxy he thought of the whole universe as just the galaxy they hadn't discovered further galaxies uh, back then he thought that maybe the whole galaxy emerged by chance from kind of thin, diffuse, high entropy state. Because if you wait infinitely long, eventually you'll hit basically anything that has a finite chance of occurring. So could be a whole galaxy, could be just a brain, but that's the kind of Boltzmannian chance hypothesis. So, and that is just kind of a an extension of vanilla theory. That doesn't mean that physicists necessarily think this is true or that we've established it, but it's it what it's what seems to follow most simply and most naturally from the theories that we currently accept. So, if we accept that, <laughs> yeah, uh, then think about what happens if you were to say raise your hand right now. You would perturb a whole bunch of particles, like a photon might reflect off your hand in a way it otherwise wouldn't and go out the window and fly out into interstellar space. And then eventually it will interact with another photon or another particle and disturb it in some way. And that particle will then perturb another particle, which will then perturb another particle. So uh, we call these ripples. Uh, 
So what happens is you raise your hand and it starts all of these causal ripples. There's, although ripples may occasionally come to an end with no further causal consequences, probably the best model of the way ripples work is that most of them don't come to an end, right? Every ripple then causes further effects, which then cause further effects, which then cause further effects. And whatever ones kind of get canceled out or come to a stop with no effect, there will be many more uh, that continue on with an effect. Mm -hmm. So then you imagine these causal ripples continuing into the post-heat death universe. They will now interact with these galaxies or brains or whatever that come into existence by chance so that eventually there will be a galaxy that comes into existence by virtue of Boltzmannian chance that wouldn't have come into existence had you not raised your hand just now, <laughs> right? So the causal ripples from you echo into this infinitely enduring, high entropy, chancy set of universes. So now all of the things that happen in that galaxy wouldn't have happened except for the fact that you raised your hand. They wouldn't have happened there and then to those particular entities who exist in that galaxy, right? Yeah. They would have happened eventually, assuming that they got some finite chance in an infinitely enduring universe, but not there and then to those people. So in that sense, everything you do, or almost everything you do, will, on kind of vanilla physical theory, eventually cause virtually every type of non-unique, non-zero probability event. I don't even know what to think of <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, part of it, I, I mean, there's sort of a a lingering sort of, I don't know if I should call it a doubt or uneasiness about the use of, you know, conditional probabilities and conditionalizing, unconditionalizing, um, that most of these arguments, you know, or the, or the various, you know, this could be the case, this could be the case, or there's a certain probability that this will be the case. It's not 100% right. certain that blah, blah, blah. And I, I'm just, uh, you know, and this particular, what you just described, really makes it vivid. Uh, you know, the basic issue of, you know, how do we even, like, measure these probabilities? I mean, <laughs> what, how, yeah. how do you even, like... I mean, I understand that you're thinking, well, you know, 1%, 0.1%, but I don't, I'm not even sure how the probabilities are being, yeah, measured. Yeah. Um, I guess I should, right. This is a good, a good and important point. And it's really central to my thinking in this book that because I'm, perplexed and skeptical about lots of stuff concerning consciousness and cosmology mm -hmm. instead of doing the standard philosophical thing which mm -hmm. is here is the right theory here's the truth here's my argument for it you should believe it <laughs> instead i'm saying well here's something that might be true and here's some reasons to take it seriously Mm -hmm. in this zone between the kind of brain and a vat thing where I think we don't have to take that seriously because I think it's reasonable to have such a tiny, tiny credence in that in that zone where, okay, well, maybe it's not where the bulk of our credence lies, but it's non-trivial, right? So working in that zone of, say, less than 50% credence, but more than one in a million credence is a lot of what I'm doing in this book. And that is not what most philosophers have done for most of the history of philosophy. And the rules of that game are pretty unclear. We're not talking about things like, you know, well-established probabilities in Las Vegas games of chance, or even probabilities in uh, quantum mechanics, where those are well-established by physical theory, right? We're talking about something closer to, Bayesian subjective credences and 
Hmm. You know, the yeah. rules for thinking through those are well. The rule once you once you've got them locked in place, then you can do Bayesian calculations. But but where your so to speak priors are exactly that's very open in standard Bayesian theory, and so it's it's pretty hard from this perspective to nail down. Here's exactly what your creeds should be, <laughs> right? How do you think about the priors or the starting places? Mm -hmm. And right. So so I do think that is totally a legitimate worry. And I think part of the way that I try to deal with that in this book is to enliven the possibilities in readers minds by just saying, well, doesn't this seem like this has some chance of being true and then if that's true doesn't it seem like that would have some chance of being true and then that kind of massaging people's intuitions a little bit so that they come to share with me this sense like okay you know there's a small but non-trivial possibility of this but i can't i think as i said before i think i can only invite readers to do this i can't kind of like bang readers on the head and say rationally you have to have this credence Mm -hmm. And maybe actually that's part of the reason you mentioned that there's a kind of glee in thinking through these things, right? I think part of the reason for the tone of the book mm -hmm. being gleeful, partly it is because I think philosophy and this stuff is fun and I'm just expressing my own glee, right? But also I think the idea that it's fun and interesting and exciting that's part of the invitation, uh -huh. right? If the reader thinks this is horrible, this is terrible, yuck, then I think they're going to be less likely to accept the invitation than if they're like, oh yeah, this is, this is fun. This is interesting. Right. And it's not, there's no, there's no intent or, or you tell me if there is to, um, I, I don't know how to, 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 I mean, is this supposed to have you know, again, it's, it, it is in the, you know, largely in the spirit of fun, but do you think there are any, you know, scientific or practical, uh, you know, implications or, you know, contributions to be made other than just, I'm having a lot of fun, which <laughs> is very clear in the book, it's very clear, um, and it is fun. And there's no doubt about that, you know, but it's, it's, it's fun the way, you know, certain games are fun and, uh, or, or, you know, just, you know, certain activities that we do are fun, are playful. Um, so it's play, it's intellectual play. Uh, but is it more than that? I hope so. <laughs> Play is really useful. I mean, I like this connection with play. And in fact, at the very end of the book, I bring this back to Alison Gopnik's theories of play and childhood and the kind of curiosity and exploration that children have and that she thinks scientists also tend to retain and that I keep. Right. So one contrast I draw here is between how a child reacts to getting a, a new computer and how we boring adults react, right? I just want my new computer to be just like my old computer and it to work without my having to learn anything. And I don't want to play, play around with my computer, right? But a kid, they're like, oh, I'm going to change the sounds. I got to make new background paper. They mess around with the settings. They do all this stuff, mm -hmm. right? So they play with it. And in the process, of course, they come to understand how the computer works through their play much better than my non-playful put it to work attitude has right so in a way at a, at a at a first pass you might think the adult's attitude is more pragmatic but actually i think there's a kind of long-term value in play there's a pragmatic use mm -hmm. in opening your mind exploring that we can lose if we're too quick to settle on, ah, we're, we're, here's where the truth is. Mm -hmm. So I think science and has not really, and philosophy have not really settled the questions of the fundamental structure of the universe and 
how consciousness arises from immaterial stuff. In fact, if in fact it does arise from immaterial stuff. So I think it's good for us to be still in this playful mode of thinking through possibilities. And some of these possibilities might be true that we tend to think we maybe initially thought weren't. And even if they're not true, just the exercise of relaxing away from your initial scientific and commonsensical presuppositions about, oh, this is how things must be, Mm -hmm. I think is useful for being ready, both as an individual and perhaps as a culture, for new discoveries beyond the limits of what we already know. Cool. Well, um, on that note, um, I think we're, we're, we are running out of time. So I'd like to end with a, a question about what's uh, on the horizon for you. Uh, are you turning to some different philosophical project or continuing this thumb, this one? What, uh, what are you working on now or in the near future? Right. Well, I'm currently working on 11 different papers and a book proposal. <laughs> I've always got lots of stuff going on. I'm kind of a little philosophically uh, attention deficit. But uh, <laughs> let me just mention one because it's one that I'm working on right now and I'm kind of excited about, which is thinking about more about the conditions under which we would be justified in attributing consciousness to AI systems. Mm-hmm. I've got a few papers in in development on this. You know, I think this is going to be an important and urgent question. People are already starting to think, "Oh, maybe some of these AI systems really are conscious." And even if you are a skeptic uh, or pessimist about AI consciousness and think it will never come, I think as a society, people are going to probably pretty soon be starting to think AI is conscious, some AI systems, and there are going to be some consciousness researchers who say, hey, according to my theory, the system really is conscious, and then we'll be thrown into, I think, epistemic doubt. We won't know whether mm-hmm. our AI systems are conscious. There'll be some theories that say yes, some theories that say no, and we don't know what to do with that, mm-hmm. and there are likely to be big moral implications either way we go. So there's a chapter in the book on this, but I'm continuing uh, to work on these ideas and think about, um, think about, try to think a little more systematically about, okay, what, under what conditions should we, or should we not think, ah, this AI system probably is, or probably is not conscious. Okay. Well, I look forward to seeing that. It's certainly a very hot topic at the moment. Um, so I'm sure a lot of people will be interested in seeing what you, what you come up with <laughs> on that. <laughs> but in you can the be meantime, sure it will be somewhat okay. skeptical. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. That's fine. Um, so, well, thank you again for taking the time to talk with me about your, your new book, The Weirdness of the World. And I uh, wish you good luck with those dozens and dozens of projects that you are working (laughs) yeah thanks so much it's been a pleasure chatting with you okay bye bye you've been listening to my interview with eric schwitzgabel professor of philosophy at the university of california at riverside we've been talking about his new book the weirdness of the world which is just out from princeton university press i'm carrie figdor this is new books in philosophy I hope you enjoyed the podcast and thank you for listening.